So Simon Wilson is going to be our last speaker before our break. So let's delve into the embeddings. What are they and why they matter? Our distinguished speaker is Simon Wilson today. Beyond creating data set and open source tool revolutionizing data exploration, Simon has spent time as a JSK journalism fellow at Stanford, developing tool rooted in his experience as a data journalist for the U uh, UK's Guardian. He's an integral part of Eventbrite after they acquired Lenry, a company he co-founded. Plus, many web developers here might recognize him as the co-creator of Django, hmm. web framework. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Simon Wilson. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Pi Bay. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about embeddings, um, which... And I'm really using this as a kind of excuse to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff as well. I'm going to be demonstrating a variety of tools that I've been building over the past 12 months to six years now um, to help explore data and prototype things and do, do quick and interesting experiments. But embeddings are a technology that is adjacent to this whole field of large language models. Um, you know, the technology behind ChatGPT and Bard all of that kind of stuff, which has been consuming my life over the past 12 months because I can't tear myself away from how weird and slightly horrifying they are. And um, embeddings is a sort of small part of the, that overall slice, which I feel is one of those little things where it's this trick that once you know how to use it, you suddenly realize you can apply it to all sorts of interesting problems um, that you might come across. So I'll start with a, a very sort of high level idea of what embeddings even are. Embeddings is a trick, and the trick is that you can take a piece of content, in this case we've got a blog entry, and you can turn that piece of content into an array of floating point numbers, and that's the entirety of the trick. You take content in whatever shape it is, and you turn it into this array of numbers. The key thing about this array of numbers is that it's a fixed length long, so based on the embedding model that you're using, you will get back 300 floating point numbers, or 1,000 floating point numbers, or 1,536 point, um, floating point numbers, which you can then do stuff with. Because these numbers that come back are actually coordinates. They're a location within a very weird, many multi-dimensional space. So if you have 1,536 numbers, it's hard to visualize, like here I visualized it with, in, in 3D with just three dimensions, but anything that you can do this trick to ends up located somewhere in that space. And the reason that's interesting and that's useful is that what gets, what, what's, what's powerful about this is what's nearby because the embedding vector, this bizarre array of numbers, represents what this model understands about the meaning of that content. And there are hundreds of different models that can do this, but a lot of them can take that and turn it into some kind of semantic meaning. So those numbers represent facts about the world and colors and shapes and concepts and all of these different things. Nobody really understands what the numbers mean, but we know that if you plot them into, into this dimensional space, you can start doing interesting things. So I'm going to start with um, one of the first experiments I did around embeddings, and that's to solve the problem of serving up related content on one of my sites. So this right here is my TIL blog. TIL stands for Today I've Learned. And this is a blog where every few days I post up an article about something that I've figured out. And what I love about this as a writer is this is a very liberating format because the only barrier to should I write about it is, did I just learn this thing? I don't have to think about, is this expanding the frontiers of human knowledge and making an exciting point? No, 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 this is, I figured out a for loop in Bash. I'll write about for loops in Bash. It's mainly for me, it's like public notes. If it's useful to you as well, that's great. But I've got a lot of these now. I've got, what, 470 of them, I think. And at the very bottom of each one, there's this table, there's this list of related content. And these, this is entirely automated, and it's actually really good, right? This is an article about geospatial SQL queries, and it says, oh, well, that's probably related to GeoPoly and SQLite, well, it's related to GeoPackage and KNN queries and all of this stuff. This is very, there's not much content about GIS stuff on my blog, but all of it came up as related. And I can navigate through and see, okay, MB tiles, that's a tiling thing, that's related to GeoPackage. All of this stuff just starts relating together. And the secret behind this feature is it's done purely using this concept of embeddings. Now, 
this website here, this this TIL website, is actually running on top of one of my of my major open source projects, which is this thing I've been building called Dataset. And Dataset is a web-based front end for a SQLite database. So you get a bunch of data about anything you like, you stick it in the SQLite database, and you run Dataset on top of it, and you get this interface that shows you the tables that are available, and you can run SQL queries against them and do bits and pieces like that. And one of the features of Dataset is custom templates. So actually, all of this website, it's just a bunch of custom Ginger templates that I put on top of that sort of default application. But because we've got these in the database, we can start running queries. And I've got this table called, I've got a table called TIL, which is all of my content. So each of those articles has like a path and a title and the URL and the markdown body and that kind of thing. And then I created the separate table called embeddings. And all that does is it maps each of these article titles to this weird blob of numbers, right? This, in this case, it's 6,000 bytes of binary data. I tried to compress it down into, into a, an efficient format. Um, and I can run a hex function against it. So I can say, okay, turn that into hexadecimal. It still looks like binary data. Or I've got my, um, this custom Python function I wrote, LLM embed decode. And that actually shows you what these things are. So this right here, it's a binary representation of that list of 1,536 floating point numbers. But again, where this stuff gets fun is when you start using comparisons between those locations to figure out what, in this case, what's related. So I do everything in SQLite and SQL fu and with, with SQLite and, um, and uh, SQL functions these days. This is my sort of default for hacking around with interesting data because I've been building this software that, that lets you do this kind of thing. And so I built this uh, custom Python function called LLM embed, LLM embed cosine, which runs a cosine similarity just to judge the distance between two vectors. And this is a dataset plugin, which adds that as a SQLite function. And now I can call it. So I can say select ID comma LL embed cosine. So the cosine distance between the embedding in that table. And here I've just got a little sub select that looks up the embedding of one specific article, that one I started with. Select that as score, orders by score, descending. When I run the SQL query, I get back a 1.0 perfect score for the same article, which makes sense. You'd hope that they're exactly in the same spot. Um, and then you can see these distance scores to these other articles that are related. If I order by score and cut off at 10, I get back a decent set of related results. So really, it's actually really simple to, to pull this together. I've got, what, 470 items in here, so I can just do a SQL query that does literally a brute force comparison of scores between all of them, and it works, and I get back that related content. Um, the... What I actually ended up doing, it was taking about 400 milliseconds to do each of these. So I ended up pre-calculating them. I've got a table here called similarities, which has 4,900 rows. And it's just for each article, what are the similarity scores for the other sort of top 20, I think, articles that that's related to. And then I've got a bit of Python code that runs a SQL query against that and a bit of template code that drops that into the template. And that's the entirety of the feature. That's the whole thing. So... The, the way the site works, it's actually deployed, um, it's deployed using Vercel, which is a very inexpensive hosting provider where you can stick state, you, the idea with Vercel is it's serverless hosting for stateless projects. So you can stick some code on there and it'll run whenever somebody visits your website. Traditionally, you wouldn't use databases with, sta with stateless hosting because a database is a thing that has state. You need a like hard disk and backups and all of that. But because this website here is read only right it's a blog nobody's writing anything to these except when i publish a new story i can actually publish the sqlite database as part of the application that gets deployed to vercel i call this the bake to data architectural pattern because you're baking your data into your deployment asset um and then the way things is actually built is just github actions right this is a github actions workflow it runs every time i commit to my repository full of til documents and one of the things it does, it builds everything, it loads it into a SQLite database. It actually generates screenshots for them to use in social media cards as well. And then it runs a little command I wrote that hits the OpenAI API to pull back these, embe these, um, these embedding vectors and writes them into the database, calculate similarity. It's all just one big build process, but that gives me that functionality. It gives me those related results. Um, 
if you want to see exactly how this worked, I wrote up a TIL on my TIL website about how my TIL website's embeddings work. It, it's all here. So this is a very detailed article that shows exactly how all of this stuff works and also links to some sort of other SQL queries that you can start running. This query is quite fun, actually. This one here, I decided to say, okay, of all of my 470 articles, which are the most similar pairs, right? If you were to calculate the similarity scores between everything, what's the most similar? And it turns out the most similar is running tests against Postgres in a service container and talking to a Postgres service container from inside a Docker container, which are practically the same article. And I wrote them several months in, uh, apart without remembering that I'd already written about them. And yeah, nano GP. This is actually kind of cool, right? It's kind of fun being able to see, oh, look at all of the most similar pairings of, of content that I've got out there. So that's kind of a demonstration of quite how much fun you can start having once you've got this ability to calculate the similarity scores between just arbitrary chunks of text in this case. But where do we actually get these things from? So I just meant, well, I just mentioned, um, I mentioned the OpenAI API. For this particular experiment, what I've been doing is um, hitting OpenAI's embeddings API, which is one of the easiest APIs I've ever used. You do an HTTP post to v1 slash embeddings. You pass it in some text, what is shop scraper in this case, but you can give it an entire article of, of content up here, pass in an API key, and it gives you back that list of floating point numbers. That's kind of cool. There is one catch, which is that OpenAI is still quite a new organization, and they haven't quite figured out the importance of the longevity of these APIs. So a few months ago, they announced that they were shutting down a whole bunch of their models and saying, hey, upgrade to this new model instead. One of the models they shut down was their older embedding model. And that means that if you've spent a bunch of money embedding millions of documents worth of content, suddenly those, those lists of floating point numbers are useless to you because you, can't, you don't have access to that model to generate more in the future. So actually, um, although this works really well, I have slight regrets in, in, in having built this feature against this sort of clo this proprietary um, model that I can't guarantee will keep on working. The good news is it's really easy to run these models yourself. And I'll talk about that in, at length in a moment. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is just to give you a little bit more of an idea about how these things actually work. I mean, this is like modern machine learning language model stuff. So there is nobody on earth who really understands how it works. This is one of the things that's so fascinating and frustrating about this field. But there's a, a demonstration that I think helps a little bit is um, something that Google uh, Google Research put out, oh, wow, 10 years ago now. Um, this was the, I mean, it's an academic paper, so the title is terrible. Efficient Estimation of Word Representations in Vector Space. This is the Word2Vec paper. They created this model called Word2Vec, which could take a single word and turn it into a list of numbers. And they wrote it up. And this was really where the widespread interest in this embeddings technique really started was this thing 10 years ago. So Word2Vec... Um, Here's a demo that somebody built of word to vec You can see this has a JSON file, uh, effectively a JSON file, with a bunch of words, and each word has a list of 300 floating point numbers associated with it. And those numbers try and capture something about the meaning of those words. And there's a really interesting thing you can do with that. You know, you can look up words like Paris and see what are the words that are most similar according to those scores. Um, so France, French, Brussels, Madrid, Rome. We've got a mixture of French things and city and European cities in here. But the really neat trick is that you can do arithmetic with these things. I can say, take the vector for Germany, add Paris and subtract France. What do we get back? And the answer is we get back a location that's closest to Berlin. So something about this model has captured the idea of different nationalities and capitals of countries and so forth to the point that you can use arithmetic to learn weird sort of numeric facts around the world. That's kind of fascinating. And um, I think that illustrates a little bit of what's going on under the hood with these things. Although again, like I said, nobody fully understands quite why these things work. Word to Vec, they gave it 1.6 billion words of content and trained up this vocabulary of I think about 30,000 words. The models that we're using today, 10 years later, that just dwarf that in absolutely colossal. But the thing works. You can, we have this trick that we can now use to do interesting things. So let's talk about running these models ourselves. And this is where I, I get to talk about the other major open source project I'm working on these days, which is this piece of software I've been building called LLM. 
and I've lost the tab with that. There we go. So LLM is a command line utility and Python library I've been built building to manipulate and work with large language models. Um, and it's something you can install. You can pip install LLM. Uh, you can install it from Homebrew as well. So you can do brew install LLM. And then you can you get a command line app that you can start using to fire things through language models. Um, out of the box, it can work with the OpenAI API. So you can say LLM 10 fun names for a pet pelican, and it'll give you 10 fun names for a pet pelican. Let's do that. Um, and that's just making an API call direct. Here we go. Paddle, squawk, feathers, flipper, nibbles. These are quite good. They're quite good names for, for a pet pelican. All of my examples end up having pelicans in for some reason. Um, but that works. Uh, but you can also install plugins for it. So there are plugins for LLM that will add models that can run directly on your laptop. My, I've got a, an M2 MacBook Pro here. It can run some pretty decent language models. I've had things run on here that feel like they're getting towards the quality of, of the chat GPT model running entirely locally. Um, I'm actually running low on battery, so I'm, I'm nervous to try one right now because the CPU and the GPU will start crunching for like, 30, for, for like 15 seconds to get a result out of it. But it does work. So what I did a few months ago is I extended LLM to add tools for working with embeddings as well. So now you can take my LLM tool, um, you can install it, you can say pip install LLM. Then you can install a plugin for one of these one of these embedding models. There's a library called Sentence Transformers from Hugging Face, which makes it, which sort of opens up a whole world of models that you can run on your own machine. I've got a plugin for it called LLM Sentence Transformers, which you can install. Then you can register a embedding model, which will download that model onto your computer. Here I'm registering the all mini LM L6 V2 model. These things all have very catchy names. Um, but then once you've done that, you can run commands on your computer that will embed content and store those embeddings locally for you to do interesting things with. Um, there's a command called embed multi, which takes the name of a collection. So I'm going to say, create me a collection of embeddings called readmes, run them using the sentence transformers mini LM one, and then look for every file in my home directory, which matches star star slash readme.md and find all of those files and run them through the embeddings models and then store that in a SQLite database on, on my computer. And so I've done that. And as a result, I can now, um, I've now got this database of, it turns out, how many is it? it turns out there are a lot of readmes on my computer. Um, so I've got an embeddings collection. Where are we? So I've got a collection called readmes. There were 16,796 readme files on my machine. This took, I think, about half an hour to run, but it worked. And now I can see for each of those readmes, I've stored the full content of it, but I've also got this weird magic embedding number that I can then use to start, um, start running searches. So let's do that right now. I'm going to run a, another command that I wrote called um, LLM similar. I seem to have lost it. I'll do, here we go, LLM similar readmes dash C, and I'm going to say I want things that are related to SQLite backups. The dash C means take this content from this string, and that jumped out, dumped out a whole bunch of stuff. If I pipe it through JQ and say just give me the IDs, here are the top 10 results on my, of readmes on my computer that relate to the concept of SQLite backups. This is good actually, SQLite dump, there's a repair tool. These are these are all decent results for, and there's a thing at the bottom, which is a backup of my blog that uses SQLite as well. So this worked. And then um, what's interesting about this is that it's not guaranteed that the term backups um, appeared in the in those readme texts itself, but they, they there's a way of thinking about this. This isn't, we sometimes we call it semantic search. It's sort of vibe-based search, right? The vibes of those readmes related in this weird multi-dimensional space version of meaning of, of meaning of words, they, they ended up somewhat similar to this concept of a SQLite backup. Absurdly useful. Like um, if anyone's built a search engine for a website, you know, you build it as full text search and then none of your users use it. They use Google instead because Google built a better search engine than you did because Google are better at search, right? But when you start messing around with this kind of stuff, it almost feels like we can start building 
that sort of better level of search ourselves, right? Like exact matching search is useful if you're searching for function names. For a lot of the search problems that we want to solve, you don't really need exact matching. Um, and so actually this idea of semantic search is incredibly powerful. Um, so another tool that I built is a tool which was, again, originally as part of my explorations into, um, into language models, I built this tool called Simbex. And the idea with Simbex is I wanted a way to see the Python functions and classes, the Python symbols in my code base really easily. So I can say things like Simbex dash S and it'll output just the just the, the signatures. So this is classes and functions and so forth. I can say Simbex dash dash function and get back just a list of all of the functions that exist in my code base. And I'd already built this tool when I was building my embedding stuff. And I realized, hang on a second, what if Simbex could grew the ability to output like JSON or CSV representing the things that are found. And then I could pipe those into my embedding tool and generate embeddings for all of the functions in the in my code base. And so that's exactly what I've done here. I've got a embeddings database that has embeddings, this time using a brand new model called GTE Tiny, which is only about 60 megabytes. Some of these things are actually quite small, but this is embeddings of all of the functions in my main, pro in my main project. And now I can do searches. So I can say things like list plugins, and it'll do an embedding of the term list plugins and compare that to these pre-calculated embeddings of all of the functions. And sure enough, the top result is a function called plugins, which is a click, pro click, a click thing that lists all of my plugins. There's one called get plugins that does the same thing. I've now got vibe-based search against a code base. And this is something I knocked out in sort of 30 seconds. I ran a couple of commands and I was up and running and, the, and, and now, I, I, now I can start doing this as well. So really, the, the, the key idea here is when you've got SQLite as your sort of central, central substrate, anything you can get into SQLite, you can use these other tools with. And you've got command line tooling that can be piped together. You can start building some really sophisticated combinations of these things. Here I've got one tool that can output JSON representing all of my functions. I've got another tool that can take that JSON, run it through an embeddings model, and store those embeddings. And then I've got my data set interface here that lets me run those searches on top. And it all ties together into, I mean, right now I've got semantic vibe-based search against code, but you can imagine pretty much anything else that you could pipe through the same process, you could do the same, same kinds of things with. Which leads me to, I think, to my current favorite embeddings model, um, which is this thing called Clip. So Clip is actually an open AI. This is back when OpenAI were doing things in the open. They released this thing for anyone to use. That you can actually download Clip. This was January 2021. And Clip is a embeddings model that can do two things. It can embed text, so you can give it the word dog and it'll give you back a list of numbers. And it can embed f images. You can give it a photograph of a dog and it will give you back a list of numbers. But the magic is that those numbers, those, they exist in the same vector space and the text for the word dog will end up in a similar location to a photograph of a dog, which is wildly exciting and kind of confusing when you start thinking about it originally. So I built this demo. This is, um, this is actually running the clip model directly in the browser because a lot of these models have been ported to JavaScript now as well. And so here what I can do is I can upload a, well, I can open up an image on my computer. I open up this image of, of, of a beach and then I can give it, oops, and then I can give it text. So I can say, Let's see, is this similar to the word city? And it says the similar to score to the word city is 22%. To beach is 29%. To beach sunny is 29%. If I add California, it goes up to 30%. This is a beach in California. I don't know if it definitely knew that. But it's kind of fascinating, right? Because this is my browser doing all of this work. It's taking the text here. It's um, turning that into a weird vector of, of floating point numbers doing this cosine similarity distance between that and the image and giving me back those that give, give me back that score. Out of the box, this is kind of useless, right? There's not much use, that it's not particularly useful to look at a photograph and go, how similar is that to the word, I don't know, chaos theory? It's not very similar to the word chaos theory, but that, that didn't really help me that much. But of course, the trick is when you start building additional interfaces on top of this, using this to find photographs that are similar to other photographs or doing this sort of vibes-based search against them. And that's what a friend of mine did. This is Drew Brunig, um, who hangs around on the, on the dataset Discord and plays with all sorts of projects in that space. He was renovating his bathroom and he needed to buy faucets for his bathroom. 
And being a nerd, he ended up scraping 20,000 photographs of faucets from a faucet supplier and running clip against them using my LLM um, clip, clip tool. And he built this. This is called Faucet Finder. And what this lets you do is it lets you find a really, ex if you find a really expensive faucet that you love, you can use this and say, okay, find similar faucets to this really expensive one. And if you're lucky, it'll come up with some cheap ones that have the same kind of vibes as your expensive faucet. I, I love this. Like it's, it's such a beautifully niche thing to, to build. Um, and I mean, look at this, like the similarities are actually pretty great. But of course, the really fun trick with this is that you can now do text search against faucets. And um, he's running this, his demo runs on Dataset. This is, uh, if you hack around the URL, you can find his database of all of these embeddings. And so I built this. This is a, um, a this is an observable notebook that hits his API. And hit, it's, it's, I've, I've set up an API that can do clip text embeddings. It compares against his API. So now I can do things like search for bird and I will get back, fingers crossed. Ooh, I hope this works. This is a, a previously cached search for purple. There we go. Look at this. There are faucets that look like a bird. That's amazing. I don't know why you always get boring ones come up. I think these faucets are so average that the um, whatever calculation you run, they somehow end up end up in there. But yeah, or you can say terror and get really frightening looking faucets. Um, there we go. That one right there. I think that that is that is quite a frightening faucet. Or if you search for gold, you'll get the gold ones. It works. We now have vibes-based search for faucets. Uh, let's do Nintendo. I think that one comes up quite well as well. Yep, there we go. That one right there has definitely got a bit of a Nintendo 64 vibe going on. It's amazing, right? We we can we can now apply this to to all sorts of weird and wonderful things in our lives. And again, this isn't very difficult to do once you know the trick. Once you know that. You can grab this model, you can download it. You can, in, 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 in this case, I've got um, support in my LLM tool for just running a command line script or running a Python function that will give you back these embeddings. Once you've got them, you store them somewhere. And then the, the trick is to just comp is, is to compare them in that way. There are a bunch of other th fun things you can do with these. Um, one thing that's kind of fun, you can use them for clustering because again, they exist in locations in this weird multi-dimensional space. I wrote a plugin called LLM cluster that lets you say, okay, cluster, in this case, all of the issues that have been reported against my LLM project. And when you cluster, you say, basically, give me 10 clusters. That's kind of frustrating. I want it to pick the right number. I've not figured out how to do that yet, but it'll cluster them into 10 clusters. And the clusters do end up being kind of similar, right? There's a cluster here that appears to be things about different command line options I was running. A fun trick I did with this is I added a option where you can ask it for a summary and it will then take each of those clusters feed them through a language model like gpt4 and use that to generate a heading for those clusters which is kind of neat so you end up with like um these ones relating to continuing the conversation mechanism and management all of that kind of stuff um another thing you can do is you can take those 50 that that weird dimensional space and you can run a thing called pca um which i forget what it stands for principal component analysis or something Yes, which reduces the dimensions. So in this case, um, Matt Webb ran embeddings against every episode of a BBC podcast and used that to reduce them all the way down to two dimensions. And now you can hover over and see, okay, the 30 Years War, the Indian Mutiny, the Battle, of, this is all war -y ones. And over here, you've got science in the 20th century, the physics of time, chaos theory, relativity. Those are the sort of like academically scientific ones. And it kind of works. Like it's pretty amazing that reducing, I think this was the 1500 dimensions, just two, still gives you clusters of, of, of things that, that are kind of meaningful when you start scanning through them. One more trick. Um, Amelia Wattenberger wrote up a brilliant idea where she was trying to do an analysis of text that people were writing to help them write better by saying, okay, try and write, try, try and use... Um, try and use a conc some have, have, have a difference between your concrete terms and your abstract terms in terms of sentences. How do you calculate if a sentence is concrete or abstract? You come up with a list of 20 concrete sentences, a list of 20 abstract sentences, embed them, calculate the average of each of those things, and then in the new input, you can say, okay, which of those extremes is it closest to? And you can even turn that into a color scheme. So here's like sort of a color scale of how close a sentence is to the sort of average of these previously picked things. So you can use this for categorization, for picking topics, things, all sorts of applications of this kind of technique here as well. 
it's kind of fun, right? There's um, once you once you understand how to use these things, there's a surprising array of problems that you can start pointing them to. And I will finish with one last demo, which is why I got interested in embeddings in the first place. And that's this idea of using them to answer questions, um, well, answer questions about content. It's this idea called retrieval augmented generation. And um, in my case, what I did is I built a piece, I built a thing against my blog that can answer questions using data from my blog. So I can say things like, what is ShotScraper, which is a piece of software I wrote a couple, a couple of years ago. And it'll tell me what ShotScraper is, is an English, as, as a paragraph of English text. The way it does that is firstly, it looks for all of the paragraphs of my blog that are similar to the question that was asked. And then it cobbles them all together into a block of text, sticks them through GPT-4 or Llama 2 on my laptop or whatever, sticks the question at the bottom and says, okay, answer this question using this context that I found of relevant um, content. The super interesting thing about this one is this is another example of a, uh, one of these embedding models. This is a thing called E5 Large V2, terrible name. But what this lets you do is it lets you embed two types of sentence. You can have sentences that are passages. So that's like passage, colon, a paragraph of text from my blog. And then you can have sentences that are queries, which is qu a question that somebody is answering. The reason you do that is if you want to answer somebody's question, the similarity between a question like what is shop, shot scraper, that might not match exactly to a sentence that tells you what shot scraper is because they're different sort of ways of discussing the world. But this embedding model has been trained to know that query colon is a question, passage colon is something full of facts. Plot those into the same space such that a question that is likely to be answered by a passage of text will end up in the same spot. Weird trick, it totally works. Like I've got a thing, I now have a script that can run on my laptop where I can say, what is shot scraper? Oops. And it will, and there's actually like, I've seen, I've had this work completely offline, no internet connection at all, using models that are running locally. And it gives me back really good answers for questions that are being answered directly, but uh, answered using, in this case, 18,000 paragraphs of text that I, I, I pulled in from my site. So, this is kind of cool, right? There's a lot of really neat things you can do with this. Um, I will be turning this talk, turning my notes from this talk into a very detailed write-up with links to source code and examples and things that you can play with. So please check out my um, website in probably a couple of days, uh, sim uh, simonwilson.net. I'll have all of that information for you. And yeah, I think I've got some time for questions. Thank you, Simon. All right, any questions? Here we go. Let's go. Hey, hi, uh, Bupesh here. So uh, I think you're also familiar with Langchain, uh, which yes. also like uh, vectorizes the words and paragraphs into the embeddings which ChatGPT yep. can understand. This is one of the tricks that Langchain has, yeah. Lang Langchain... Langchain was, I mean, the problem with Langchain is that it's huge and it does everything. Like, it, it could take you a month just to understand everything it did. But yeah, one of the initial capabilities of Langchain was almost exactly that demo I showed at the end. The thing where you take content, you do the embedding vectors, stick them in some kind of vector storage, and then use them to answer questions. And yeah, it's, it's sort of fundamental to a whole bunch of the exciting stuff people are doing around language models at the moment. But as I hope I've just demonstrated, you can use it for all kinds of other things that aren't directly related to, to the language model stuff as well. Yeah, I really like the part where you kept the flexibility of like uh, playing around with embeddings, like with the cluster or with the a, with a, uh, with a image or with the text, uh, because Langchain doesn't give you that. It's more huh. of a text think yeah uh, you can uh, like yeah i really like that part my, my my approach is quite like langchain is trying to be one framework that does everything i'm sort of taking this on from a slightly different approach of lots of li the unix style philosophy lots of little tools that can all speak to each other and solve different parts of the problem and then i'm using sqlite database files as my sort of central coordination point for this stuff yeah that's the best part thanks thanks for the session hi thank you for the the demonstration. I was wondering, uh, so early on you picked a uh, cosine similarity function, I think it yep. was. And I was wondering uh, if you did a lot of playing with uh, changing that and seeing how much that... I've done no on. playing with that at all. Basically, if there, are, there are a bunch of different distance functions you can use. Everyone else defaults to cosine, so I went with cosine. 
And in fact, I've got like five different implementations of cosine similarity. I didn't write any of them. ChatGPT is so good at writing cosine similarity functions. Like, yeah, write one in JavaScript. Now do one in Python. Now do one in Python that decodes this binary format first. It, it's, all, it's all just like that, yeah. But yeah, that's um, one of the things that's so interesting about this is there are so many knobs that you can tune. You can tune which distance function you're using, which embedding model you're using, what kind of prompts you're using to answer questions. There's just, and the hardest question in all of this is getting the exact right set of content to feed to a language model to answer a question. And I feel like we're just getting started figuring out the best approaches for that at the moment. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, uh, hi. What do you need to adjust if you have like one billion uh, objects? Not. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, if you have one billion objects, what do you need to adjust in your code system? Do you mean for, for so most of all of the demos I showed today were just brute force because I had like 20, up to twenty thousand, and you can brute force twenty thousand cosine similarities really quickly. But yeah, um, if you want to do this against much larger contents, that's where you want some kind of specialized index, and there's actually a like every week there's a new vector database startup launching. That's all these things are, right? Vector databases are just databases that are really good at doing indexed, optimized, cosine similarity style comparisons. I don't think vector databases are, I, I'm unconvinced by them. I think what we need are indexes, vector indexes for our existing databases. There's a couple of options for Postgres these days. SQLite has a, a there's an extension called SQLite VSS that does that. There's lots and lots of options here. But yeah, so if you want to do this stuff quickly, you need to do a bit more work, but there are dozens of solutions you can you can select from. Have 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 you found your Pelican faucet yet? I uh, there's no Pelican faucet. The closest there's a sort of swan one, but I, I send that to my I send that to my partner. I was like, "Hey, we should we should get this for our bathroom." She's like, "Absolutely not." So so yeah. Any more questions? Here we go. So you've talked about a lot of interesting things that vector embeddings can do. Is there something that they can't do that you're super excited that maybe in the future they could? Or, I mean. One of the, mo the the thing that got me so excited about Clip is that Clip is it's multimodal, right? It's images and it's text in the same space. That feels like a fascinating direction for me. There's a, a Facebook put out one called Image Bind, which can also do audio and various weird 3D formats and things into the same space as the text. That that's sort of astonishing. But yeah, so I, the thing I'm most excited about, I also, I like them getting smaller. Like I want to be able to run them in my browser like I did earlier with, with one of those, those demos. That feels really interesting. And that's a theme for, of me just for all of this stuff generally. As it gets smaller, the range of things you can do with it get more interesting. Like the, um, I, I demonstrated one earlier, the, the tiny one that I used for my function lookup, that came out a couple of weeks ago and kind of, it stunned me how good it was considering it's only sort of 60 megabytes. But yeah, so I want to see them get smaller, and I also love it when they 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 the, the multimodality. I think is really exciting. Worth it. Maybe one more. Okay. All right. Thank you, Simon. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. <laughs>